I've had people reach out to me and say that they're an emotionally abusive person. Then they learn that perhaps they're only reacting to hurtful behavior with hurtful behavior. Which came first? Sometimes relationships devolve into who started what, and you're so wrapped up in things that you just can't figure out which way is up. That's why I created the podcast Love and Abuse. If you're in a relationship that seems difficult to navigate, head over to loveandabuse.com. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to the Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello, this is Paul Coliani, and I want to help you learn the skills you need to deal with life's challenges in the most emotionally intelligent way. This show consists of my personal opinions and is meant for informational purposes only. Always seek a professional for your mental health and well-being. And for those who have listened to this show over and over again, yes, I use the word skills instead of skill set. <laughs> I change it up every now and then because it feels better. Don't know if it's going to stick. We'll see what happens. Glad you're here. Good to connect with you. I have um, an interesting topic for today's episode. It's um, someone who lives with someone else, married, and uh, the other person decided to bring kids into the equation, his kids, and um, that really uh, changed things up for the person that wrote to me. So I'm just going to read you this email, and um, I don't know if I have actually a, a very good answer for this because, well, let me just read this to you, and I'll tell you why person wrote, I've listened to your podcast for years and my life turned in a way for the better that I found myself not needing it as much, which is good because I've been in a good headspace. That is until recently. Here's a little context. My husband and I have been married for a few years and I love him dearly. We enjoy each other. He's my very best friend. I knew they had kids before we married and they were on a visitation schedule, which I was okay with. Now, I'm going to leave some uh, information out here to protect her privacy, but she said, due to an incident that happened, my husband made a decision for the kids to come live with us on a full-time basis. They've only been with us for a few months, and it feels like forever. <laughs> the problem is this. I'm an introvert, and retreating to my quiet home has always been something I valued a lot. Number two is, I don't really like his kids. <laughs> She said, it sounds horrible, but if I'm going to get help, I need to be honest. They're just everything opposite of the kids I've ever interacted with, including my own son, who's the natural apple of my eye. Number three is, I now have to put things off that bring me pleasure because taking them to places is not exactly relaxing or enjoyable for me. And um, I'm in my 40s, and after having my son, I've had no desire to have any more children. I think there are people in this world that have a special place for large families and work with kids, but that is not me. This situation is making me resent my husband. It's not his fault, but he is happy and I am not. It's his past that continues to hinder our present day. Truth is, I never asked for this situation, and until three months ago, everything was fine. Now I've been made into a full-time stepmom, sharing my energy and space in a way that doesn't bring me fulfillment or joy. I feel like my home and life have been invaded by foreign elements that make me feel displaced in my own home. I don't want to lose my marriage, but I have even considered just getting an apartment to retreat to. I'm at my wit's end. Any perspective on how I can put aside the vision I had for my life and my marriage and adapt to this new situation. Thank you for any guidance. P.S. I'm back listening to the podcast again. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for sharing this. This is a very uh, difficult one to answer because uh, what do you do? You are with someone, you're married to someone, and then they introduce an element or elements that make your life miserable. It would be like if my girlfriend started smoking. I'm not a fan of smoking. I don't like smoke. It causes me, uh, it gives me a headache. I can't breathe around it. And if she just started smoking, I would think, man, I, I love everything about her, and I love being here with her. I love sharing my life with her. 
but this is just driving me crazy. I, I don't know if I can handle this. This is my retreat, just like this person was saying. I want to come home and feel like I'm safe in my own home. In fact, this does bring up another story, but I will tell you in a second. But that's what I feel. It's like, uh, what do I do now? Well, how do I handle this? And this other story is when I was married, um, my wife ended up getting a dog. And when she brought it home, I mean, she wanted this dog. I didn't necessarily want the dog, but, you know, okay. I'm going to take the full package, which we're going to talk about in a second. But the full package is I'm valuing my wife's values, what she values. And so she brought home this dog, a little small puppy, and uh, it didn't like me. <laughs> and, okay, I need to get used to it. He needs to get used to me. And I even took him to dog training, and I spent so much time with him. And he would growl at me. I would walk in the door from work, and here I am. I'm home. I feel good. I had a hard day at work. I want to relax. And what's the first thing that happens? Arr, I don't want to hear this. I don't want to deal with this. I want to be welcome in my own home. And so I started feeling, uh, I, I just started having feelings about it. Now, I had already promised to take care of the dog, so this wasn't going to end unless I did something about it. So this is when I really took the time to get to know him and continue working with him, continuing to take him to training, continuing to take him for walks, and putting in all my effort until he finally respected me as a pack leader in the house. And um, that worked out. It was fine. But I am empathizing with this person who wrote because when you come home if if home is your sanctuary and now something is interrupting that sanctity that that feeling of of peace and comfort then it's very difficult now you have nowhere to go that's why she's saying maybe I should just get an apartment so i think it's important to have your sanctuary i think it's important to have your comfort and your peace or whatever you're looking for that if you lose it, how do you get it back? What can you do to make things more comfortable? Um, and that's what I did, and that was a dog, and we ended up dealing with it, and it was fine. It, was, it, was, it worked out. For this person, her husband brought in kids, and these kids are difficult for her. These kids are a problem for her. I will be honest and say I didn't like having a dog. Just like she says, I don't like kids. I liked dogs, but I didn't like having a dog. So I can relate a little bit. But she's in a situation where she doesn't even like his kids. It's not something that she can just say, oh, they're just being brats now. To her, they're just a constant nuisance. That's what I'm guessing. A constant nuisance. She can hear them playing. She can hear them laughing. She can hear them crying. They probably come to her when they need help. And like she said, she's you know she has to take them places and she has to do whatever she can as what has become her new role as stepmom. It's difficult. I still haven't given you, given you an answer <laughs> because it's difficult. So I'm relating to you. I understand. I get it. And I mentioned something that I think is important, which is... When you have a, for example, a romantic partner in life, it's very important that, uh, you know, I'm going to go by my definition of love. My definition of love is you honor the person's path that they're on, even if you disagree with that path. I've said it in a few different ways, but that's pretty much what I look at as love. You honor someone's path to happiness, even if you disagree with that path. That means when you love someone, even if they do things that you don't like or disagree with, you still honor them. You still support them. And I'm not saying that she doesn't honor him and support him. And uh, She said he's his, her best friend. She still loves him. But these kids, <laughs> that's the difficult part. So now he has what she probably considers, my word, a nuisance or an interruption to her sanctity, to her peaceful space, her happy place. And because they exist, her happy place disappeared. 
So she brought up, maybe I should get an apartment. Maybe she said, you know, I should have a place to go when they're there, which is always. <laughs> I don't think getting an apartment is very good for the marriage. <laughs> so I'm not saying that I disagree with that concept. I'm sure it could work. I know people are married and can be continuing to be married while separated. There are people that go, you know, they're in the service and they go out for years and they're in different jobs and they go out for years and they're separated. It, it works. In fact, I know a couple that lived in two houses and two different states and they visited each other every single week until they finally got together and said, let's move in together. And it took years. So it is possible. Do you want to do it? You probably do want to do it. Should you do it? That's a different question. That would be very difficult for me. If my girlfriend said, hey, I have two kids that you didn't know about. I'm going to bring them in and we're all going to live together as one big happy family. I'd think, what? <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, what? What's going on here? Now, you knew about his kids, but I would be definitely surprised by that. And I would have words to say about it. Like, I thought, you know, I'm I'm in my 50s now. I'm nearing retirement someday, you know, in a decade or two. I want to know that the way I'm living now is going to continue this way. And it doesn't always happen. Sometimes changes come our way and we have to figure out what to do with those changes. Can we be resilient through this big change or a big change? To her, that's the question or one question can you be resilient enough through this change? She's telling me no. <laughs> she said, no, this is why I'm reaching out to you. I'm, I'm not resilient. I want peace. I'm in my 40s. I, I want to uh, go home and be peaceful. And all I do is run around and drive them places. And I just want to relax. Well, one of the things I already mentioned is how much can we support someone else's path someone else's happiness while we are still being affected. Because sure, we could look at this and say, well, she's just being selfish. Those are his kids. But she didn't ask for them. And suddenly they appear. But she knew that he had them. So she knew the possibility that he would have them more was there. Maybe. Maybe she knew that was there. Maybe she thought that the situation was never going to change. But suddenly his ex makes different plans. And now he has them full time. Well, she should just learn to love them because they're children. Maybe. <laughs> I'm not going to tell her what to do. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to say that sometimes life throws us a curveball and we don't know what to do. Because we had set in mind a vision for our future. So here she is. I have set in mind a vision of my present and my future. And now it's destroyed. Again, my words. I'm just trying to help her convey it in a different way. It sucks. This sucks. I don't like it. I don't want it. How do I get past this? How do I resolve this? How do I fix this? Here's my take on all of this. One, I don't know if I have more than one, but I'm going to go with one. You have maybe uh, eight to ten years before they grow up and they're out of the house. I'm not going to repeat what their ages are, but you might be able to figure it out. Eight to ten years before they move out of the house. And that's if they move. I know that. That doesn't sound very nice. But when they're old enough to move out of the house, at least they'll be adults. At least they'll have the option, hopefully, unless your husband wants them to stay there. But at least they'll be old enough to have that option to move out. So that means that you may have eight to ten years of not having the exact vision of your life you want. Does that sound awful? Maybe it does. I'm sure it does. Eight to ten years, that's a long time. I've been with my girlfriend almost uh, eight, eight and a half years. And uh, it, it goes by in a flash sometimes. And as you get older, it seems to go by faster. So it could be that you are, quote, stuck with this situation for the next eight to 10 years. However, as they grow up, as they become teenagers and they want to go out more, they're going to be uh, maybe less intrusive in your life or maybe more. <laughs> teenagers grow up, they get in trouble. 
um, then suddenly you have to deal with all that trouble. So I look at this one thought that they're not going to be around forever, which means we might have to compromise, sacrifice, however you see it, the next eight to 10 years of our life. I can't do that, Paul. I can't do it. I want my peace and my sanity. I want it. I want my sanity now. I get it. And so this is where I put something into a reframe and I ask you, if the doctor came up to you and said, you're going to lose your vision or your hearing or maybe a couple limbs, you know, I'm going to give you something quite debilitating, not that you couldn't handle it, but something that would affect your life greatly if the doctor said that, that you're going to lose something, something important to you, and you would actually heal in eight to 10 years. And the doctor promises that it will heal. It's just going to take eight to 10 years, but you're going to lose access to this, you know, your eyes or your ears or your limbs or something like that. It's going to be hard. I know. I, I, this is, I can't imagine losing something important to me, something that I basically am grateful for, but also take advantage of every day. I have sight. That's getting a little blurry, but I still have sight. And I take advantage of it because I have it. It's, it's there all the time. I don't have to think about it. And um, if the doctor says, oh, you're going to lose that sight for about eight to 10 years, I'm thinking, oh, oh my God, that means, what does that mean? I, I'm, I can't even see what I'm eating. I can't see it in the shower. This sounds terrible. I can't see TV or my girlfriend. I can't see anything. That would be hard for me to hear because I'm not used to it and I'm very attached to it. But if they said, when it comes back, your life's going to be back to normal. Suddenly, it's not such a fatalistic view. It's still hard, but it's not such a fatalistic view. I can look at it saying, okay, this is going, going to be, oh, you know, I, I can't imagine. It's going to be so difficult. But there is a path out of it, and it's going to end. And that makes me feel better. Because we don't always have that news. The news is sometimes, well, this is how it is forever and you'll just have to deal with it. That can be a way of acceptance as well. I've talked about that. Sometimes you just have to accept that this is going to be the way it is forever. So I can continue complaining about it, being upset about it, knowing it'll never change, which is basically almost the definition of self-torture. I know this is never going to change, but I'm going to continue complaining about it. I don't like this. I don't want this. This is not what I want my life to be, and I don't like it. I'm going to complain about it the whole time. That can be it. You could definitely go that route. I don't recommend it because life will be miserable, which brings us to acceptance. Acceptance is one of the four choices, actually. There's four choices I'm going to talk about when we come back, but acceptance is one of them. Rejection is one of them, and the consequences of both are the other two. When we come back, we'll explore that. Be right back after this. A lot of what I talk about on this show is self-help. And self-help is great and all. I mean, I've been doing this for a good nine years now, so I better be a fan of it. <laughs> I am. And I'm also a fan of speaking to a professional one-on-one -on -one when you need direct guidance through any issues you're dealing with. And that's where our sponsor, BetterHelp, comes in. There are so many ways to take care of your mind, and listening to shows like this are hopefully helpful. But I can guide you so far, but you may still have follow-up questions. You may need specific steps to follow for your unique situation. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat-only therapy sessions. You don't even have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. This is a great path for you if you can't afford traditional therapy, but you still want a professional therapist to help you with whatever you're going through. If you've wondered if you should try therapy, let me just say this. After having done it during my depression, it was a life changer. It wasn't a lifetime commitment either. I went until I was ready to venture off on my own. And here I am, many years later, <laughs> telling you that if you're looking for ways to take care of your mind and find a path out of some emotional roadblock in your life, 
Try BetterHelp. BetterHelp is two words, better and help, H-E-L-P. And you'll get 10% off your first month when you visit betterhelp.com forward slash brain. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com forward slash brain. You'll be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours, so perhaps now is the time to give your mind something truly beneficial. Welcome back. I'm going to talk about acceptance and rejection and the consequences of both. And um, this person who wrote, she does have four choices ahead of her. You may have heard me talk about this before, but those four choices have to do with acceptance and rejection. And they are accept and stay in the situation, accept and leave the situation, reject and stay in the situation, or reject and leave the situation. So if you accept the circumstances and choose to stay, that means you can't complain about it. It is what it is. You've decided that you're going to accept it and you're just going to make the best of it. But you can't complain because you've chosen to accept it. So that's the first part of it. A lot of people have trouble with that one. But life goes easier when you've chosen to accept. Uh, It reminds me of the C-3PO Star Wars uh, scene where he says, I guess this is just our lot in life. When C-3PO said that they have a tough life. This is our lot in life. This is what happens. It's nothing we can avoid. This is how it is. And he accepts it, at least in the movie. <laughs> this is just our lot in life. We just have to deal with it. So that's accept and stay. And then you have accept and leave, meaning I accept that there's nothing I can do about the situation. I accept that uh, in this example, my husband has kids and he wants to be with those kids and he has to take care of those kids. It's his obligation, it's his responsibility. And he's probably very happy about that. I accept all of that. And I'm leaving because I can't handle it. That is certainly a choice. I'm leaving because I can't handle it. I don't want to be here with those children. I'll see you in 10 years. Hopefully we can get back together. Or... I'm leaving, like you said, I'm going to get an apartment and we can still see each other, but I just need my own space. I need my own comfort. I won't deny you that choice. That is certainly available to you. I mean, it sounds like you might be able to do that from what you described. It's probably not best for the marriage, for the relationship, even for the children. Like, wow, uh, you're leaving because of us. Eesh. You know, what does that look like? I'm not trying to put that burden on you, but, you know, children, they pick this stuff up. Wow, we're so awful that she just had to leave. I don't necessarily want that to weigh in on your decision either. I'm just saying this is probably one of the outcomes that could happen. The children pick it up and they think, oh, wow, I guess we are pretty awful. So that's accept and leave. Then you have reject and stay, which I already talked about. I can't stand it. I'm going to reject this arrangement. I don't like it. And I'm going to stay. And I'm going to make sure that you know how unhappy I am the whole time I'm here. Because I don't like it. And um, I'm going to complain about it. And I'm going to be a victim to this situation. Because I'm not going to leave it. Reject and stay is probably the worst. (laughs) If you have to deal with a situation like this rejecting the situation, not accepting it, and staying in the situation is, yeah, it's the worst because it's self-torture. And it's also hurting other people in ways that you may not even realize. Like you're complaining, you're the victim, and you go on and on and on. And they feel like, wow, there's there's nothing we can do about it. We are who we are, and this is what it is, and I don't know how to help you here. I don't know what to say. They feel helpless, just like you. You feel helpless. And then you have... Reject and leave, meaning I can't stand it. I don't like it. I don't want to accept it. I'm out of here. That's certainly doable. You could do that. That has a different feel and a different tone with accept and stay or accept and leave. But um, reject and leave is saying, I'm not going to be able to handle this. I'm leaving. I'm rejecting this and I'm leaving. And that's perfectly fine. I'm, I'm not saying you should do this in this situation, but... That choice in a lot of cases is sometimes we can't stand it. Sometimes our um, peace of mind is so violated or so in trouble 
not being peaceful anymore, that we just can't handle it anymore. It's like a toxic relationship. Some people will not tolerate the toxic behavior anymore and leave. That's their choice. And it could be a healthy choice for them. In the toxic relationship, there's probably uh, not the same timeline than when kids show up in the picture. When kids show up in the picture, it's for you, 8 to 10 years, and they're adult, and maybe they can move out then. That would be great. Toxic relationship, they split up. There could be a timeline, like they go through some healing and suddenly they're a different person, the toxic person, and now they can chit-chat again and reconcile and everything's good. It could happen. Or the other person never learns and stays toxic and just blames the victim of their toxic behavior that they deserved the toxic behavior and so that never works out. But these are the four choices I like to um, apply in my own life when I have no choice. So if my girlfriend started smoking... I can choose to accept and stay, accept and leave, reject and stay, reject and leave. And that's it. I I don't give myself any other choice. That means I have to come to a conclusion. This is the most important part. You have to come to a conclusion. Otherwise, you're, again, torturing yourself, waiting for something to happen that's outside of your control. Well, I'm going to sit here until he realizes how unhappy I am and he works out an arrangement where his ex gets the kids most of the time. I'm going to be upset. He's going to see I'm visibly upset. He knows it's going to affect our marriage and our love life and our intimacy. And he's just going to have to make that decision to do something with the kids so that uh, I, I can be happier. That could be where you make this go. And I'm not saying you would. It sounds like you do love him. You want him to be happy. You see that he's happy. And the kids make him happy. Which brings us back to, can we value our partner's values enough, even if we have sacrifice? Because right now your sacrifice is your your peace, your, your security, maybe your comfort, your sanctity, your home. Your sacrifice might be that or called a compromise. Because There are probably peaceful places in your home you could go for 30 seconds at a time (laughs) or longer, hopefully. But you may become a night owl. Who knows? Maybe they go to sleep and you stay up all night. I don't know. Uh, There are many ways you can look at this if you were to choose to accept and stay. So there's that. And then, of course, with the valuing the partner's values thing, this is something I actually had to learn to figure out when I met my girlfriend she had her son and her son was staying with his dad and so I thought hey this is a great arrangement I'm with this person I love and there's no children that I have to raise because I've never done it don't know how to do it and not that I wouldn't or couldn't I mean I think I'd probably be okay doing that but I thought hey I'm getting older and it would be nice to have a relationship where the children have grown up or they're in different places so that I am not in a situation where I'm driving them to school every day, picking up from sports every day, or I'm making them dinner. So, you know, children are an extra responsibility. They're wonderful, most of them. (laughs) They're wonderful. And they're a responsibility. They're an obligation. They are definitely, um, they need you. Children need us. They need adults because they can't go out and get work and get, I mean, some of them can, but they can't do the same things we do. And we, we kind of have to hold a, hold their hands for a while until they're old enough to move out on their own. So I moved into my girlfriend's place and we had a great time until suddenly the custody arrangement changed. And now her son is with us mostly full time. So that changed things. Now I, I love her son. No problem at all. I think he's a great kid, and he's now grown up to a great adult. But at the time, I'm thinking, uh, wow, I used to have all this peace and uh, silence in the, in the house. And he wasn't a loud kid at all, but now he's in our space. And it could be anybody in your space that changes the, the energy of the space. And he was in the space and he's always needing mom and asking her questions. And I did end up bringing him to school quite a bit and picking him up and doing other things, but not 
too much. I mean, I'm definitely not complaining, but it changes the environment and my environment changed. I didn't expect to be in this situation. I thought just like this person that uh, the situation would stay the same and that would be great, but it didn't, it changed. And so now I have the four choices, accept and stay, accept and leave, reject and stay, reject and leave. I chose to accept that my girlfriend comes with a child. And this child is either going to be in her life some of the time, very little bit of the time, a lot of the time, all the time. Four more choices. <laughs> so now she has a kid that I thought wouldn't be there most of the time and that we'd have most of the space to ourselves. And now at the time he came and lived with us for a long time, a few years, I think. And that's how it was. And I had to deal with it. And I did choose to accept because my primary goal in a relationship, uh, you know, this is something I had to learn over the years. My primary goal in a relationship is to make sure my girlfriend is happy. <laughs> my partner. My, I want to make sure my partner is happy. How do I do that? I honor their path, their steps, their decisions that make them happy. And when they're happy, I'm happy, not because I'm reliant on their happiness, but because if you have a healthy partner, they do the same for you. When you make sure that your partner or anyone in your life is happy, anyone you're in a relationship with, when they're happy and you honor that path, their decisions, whatever they want to do to be happy, they usually appreciate the support of that person so much that they want you to be happy as well. What does that mean? That could mean a number of things. If I support my girlfriend's um, new hobby of kayaking every weekend, she doesn't do that, but let's just say she did. Let's just say she went kayaking every weekend and I didn't really like it. I didn't really care about it, but she wanted to go. Then she did and I didn't see her on the weekends. It would still make me happy that she was doing something that fulfilled her. It would make me feel really good because she's happy. And the, the reciprocation is if I decided, hey, you know, during the week, I want to go bowling with my buddies, something I probably wouldn't do, but maybe I'll go bowling with my buddies two or three nights a week, I would think that because I support her path, that she would support my path. And that's what I mean is that when we support someone's path to happiness, our life gets better because they do the same thing. They feel supported. They love us back again in healthy relationships. In an unhealthy relationship, you support the other person's path to happiness and they don't support yours. That's unbalanced. It doesn't work. And sometimes it's very hurtful, depending on what's going on. I'm not saying yours is, but sometimes it can be the toxic situation. Um, now, with you, what you're saying is that I need to support my partner, my husband's path to happiness, and what makes him happy are his kids is that what you're saying, Paul? Is that I need to support that? I would say, okay, most of my answer is yes, but I know where you're going. You're going is, what about my happiness? Where is my peace? Where is my comfort? Where is what I want? And that is a great question because you need to share this with your husband. I do need peace. Maybe you can arrange something where he takes the kids out twice a week. Maybe that's not enough. Maybe you need it every day. I don't know. But there has to be compromise. There has to be some compromises here. What I really believe your husband probably doesn't want is you being miserable because of his kids. Because there's nothing he can do about it. He would just be probably sad. Like, I really want my wife to be happy, but I have kids. She knows I have kids. Yeah, but she didn't think they were going to live with you. Oh... I really want her to be happy, but I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't know how to fix this. I don't know how to resolve this problem. And then he'll write to me <laughs> and say, Paul, my wife hates my kids. What do I do? Well, this is something that is very difficult because when you're in a situation and you're used to a situation and that situation changes, the relationship is altered. It will be. The relationship will be altered for the next at least 8 to 10 years. I say at least because 
Some kids like to stay a little longer and some kids get into trouble and now you're dealing with all the trouble they're dealing with and they bring you into the situation because you got to bail them out uh, and other things. Hopefully that doesn't happen. But can you look at this as something that you can find a middle ground somewhere knowing that this situation, this arrangement, him and the kids, will not change, at least for a decade. It sounds so long. It sounds so terrible. But can you find a compromise? Can you reach a middle ground? Can you get at least one or two days as rewards where the kids aren't there? You can find another place to go. You can find a new hobby that takes you into meditation retreats. There's all kinds of practical things you can look at and things you can do. But this is something that you need to talk to your husband about. Look, I want to be here for you and I am dedicated to you. And because I'm dedicated to you, that means I'm also dedicated to the full package, the whole package of you and your kids. I didn't want it, but now that it exists, I love you. I value what you value and I want you to be happy and your kids make you happy. So uh, you know, I'm making some compromises for that purpose. Can you do the same for me? That will be my conversation. This may not be the magic pill you're looking for, but that would be my conversation. So there's a lot I've given you to chew on, and I hope something in there is it tastes good. <laughs> I want you to find a place, find a compromise, and hopefully work things out. And you also have to remember that things can change on a dime. Just because you're unhappy in these few months that have occurred doesn't mean something else is going to shift. You never know what other arrangement will take place. You never know if something else will change and the living arrangement will change. You just don't know. So you could say, I'm getting an apartment, and then six months later, they're living with their mom again. Now what? Oh, well, I'll just get rid of my apartment. I, I guess so, if it's that easy. I mean, if it's that easy to do this stuff, then have at it and try it out and see what happens. But it does cause a lot of upheaval. It does cause a lot of challenges that may not have been there before. So I don't know. This is a, a tough situation. It is certainly life throwing you a curveball, something you didn't expect. And what are you willing to do for the person you love? What are, are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to compromise to see them happy? And I agree, you shouldn't be sacrificing so much that your happiness just goes out the door. There has to be reciprocation. There has to be balance. There has to be a give and take. With children, there's not often that. <laughs> it's true. When children are present in your home, typically there's a lot of work involved. There's a lot of attention and presence that you need to be around with the children because they're going to be in your space. And when somebody's in your space, it is more difficult. But can you come to an acceptance? Can you come to a compromise? Can you come to balance? And definitely talk with your husband. Talk with him and be, be honest. I, I wasn't expecting this, but now that they're here, I know there's nothing I can do about it. And there's probably nothing you can do about it. So what can we do so that I do get some peace and comfort and some sanctity while you also get the, the time with your, with your children? Now, you have to remember, let me just throw this right at you at the end. You have to remember that your husband may also deep down want you to come to accept them as well. And not just accept them, maybe even embrace them. He may want that too. I'm not going to lay a guilt trip on you here. I'm just saying that he may want that. And if that's there, you just have to keep that in mind. Just keep that in mind. Because if you say, I don't want anything to do with them. It's fine if you have them. I just want my peace. If you, if you approach it like that, it might cause some issues. He might feel very defeated. He may, he may feel like he can't do anything about it. And it might be hurtful. I don't know. But just keep that in mind because you never know until you talk about this stuff 
And at the same time, he may also say, hey, they're my kids. I know I know they're my kids. You don't have to deal with them. I will do my best to, to handle everything. But from what you've already written, it sounds like you're doing a lot. And it totally makes sense why you now feel like you're in a role that uh, you didn't ask for, but now you're being asked to accept. Not necessarily by me. I'm just giving you choices. I'm just giving you all these choices. But maybe you feel like you're being expected to do things that you didn't expect. And yeah, life can do this to you. I am so sorry that you're having this challenge, but at the same time, this could turn into something that you didn't expect. And I don't mean that the kids just go off and now they're on their own. I mean, there could be more here. Sometimes these challenges are given to us for a reason. I'm going to talk a little spiritual. You may not believe this, but it happens to me sometimes. Sometimes these challenges come and they're given to us for a reason. And what I have learned is that, is that when you accept the challenge, face it and overcome it, you know, you tackle it head on when you accept that it's there and you just deal with it and go with it, the challenge usually disappears. It never disappears, in my experience, it never disappears when you are vehemently rejecting it. I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want this. It never disappears. It, it always returns. The challenge always returns. When I re rejected my stepfather over and over and over again, I don't want it, I don't want it. Man, I heard from him all the time. <laughs> I don't want him calling me, but he always did. And then when I decided to honor my personal boundaries instead of just avoiding him and avoiding, and I told him, no, he's not welcome. I, I told him straight to his face, no, he's not welcome in. I never heard from him again. Huh. <laughs> it's amazing how that works. Suddenly you accept the challenge and you face it and you realize there was something that you needed to learn or do so that you didn't get these challenges anymore or this particular challenge. So this might be in the mix too for you. I don't know. Thanks for writing. I wish you the best with this. I appreciate you. And thanks for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I'm going to head right into the thank yous and goodbyes and my final words right after this. Be right back. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank the following patrons of the week. Stephen, Kamal, Donald, Daisy, Monica, Brad, and Holly. I recognize all your names. These are the patrons of the week. They are the financial backers of the show. They've decided to give back because they found value in the show, and I'm very grateful for that. That's why I read their names. I just want to acknowledge you. Thank you, patrons. I read different names every week. Those that are in the patron program, I appreciate all of you. And those who want to be in the patron program, you can do that by going to moretob.com. If you find value in the show, you can give back that way. And if you find value in the show and you don't want to give back, you are just as welcome to continue listening because <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you, patrons. You're the best. And I'm going to read you um, this review that I received, which says, The best ever. Paul is funny, and he helps me with a lot of problems, and I hope you can read this, Paul. <laughs> if you can't, I don't know, but if you can make sure you keep doing this stuff, because I love your content. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I never really consider myself or this show as funny, but um, I like to laugh every now and then, so I am grateful for your comment either way. Thank you so much for your words. Um, thank you. I don't, I don't know what else to say. You have made my day, and I am going to continue doing this stuff. But don't forget, I have about nine years of back material in case, um, I don't know, I can't anymore. That's not foreshadowing. I, I plan on continuing to do this for years. Thank you so much for your review. And for a show on how to deal with difficult relationships, talked about this earlier, right at the beginning of the show, in fact, visit loveandabuse.com can help you navigate those difficult times. And if you know that you're the difficult one in the relationship, head over to healedbeing.com. And that's where I help emotionally abusive people change. If you want to change the hurtful behavior that you're doing to someone that you love, head over to healedbeing.com. 
And finally, thanks to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. And my final words have to do with the guest in our house that sometimes uh, cause a bigger challenge than we expected. Like, I remember when I was married, my wife and I had a really good friend of mine stay with us for a couple months. He might even be listening now. So if you are listening, I hope you are doing well. He stayed with us for a couple months, and I, I thought it was great. I mean, we got along. He kept to himself, and um, he was the best house guest. But what ends up happening is that someone is always in your space. No matter who it is, you could have the greatest relationship with them, but if you're not in an intimate relationship with them or you're not automatically roommates or you're in an intimate relationship with somebody and somebody else comes along like this person, then what ends up happening is you don't have your personal time with the people that you really want to spend time with. And um, you could just say, hey, you know, give us some personal space, but even feeling the need to ask that, hey, give us some personal space, is like an, uh, I don't want to say a burden, but it is. It's its a burden. Like, I want extra space. And again, he was the least intrusive, most respectful of our space, of our time, and he stayed out of our way. But no matter who it is, your best friend, um, your brother, your sister, whoever it is, What ends up happening is that because they're occupying space, they're also occupying your ability to want to be yourself 100%. And that means if you want to come out of your bedroom scratching your butt with no clothes on, sorry for the visual, but you want to do anything you want, you can't because that person's in your house. So it is difficult on an individual or a couple to have another person in their space for that very reason. And when you have someone in your space, it can change who you are, or at least how you behave. Like you can't necessarily be 100% yourself. And this is what she was talking about. I can't be myself. The, The person I am is an introvert. I want time by myself. I want space. I want quiet. And I can't have that now. So I can't be myself. That's like one of the worst things that can happen to us is not being able to be ourselves. Some relationships will do this to us. They will uh, prevent us from being ourselves. That's like when I talk about the toxic relationships over at loveandabuse.com. The toxic relationship is someone who wants you to conform to who they want you to be. That's not the only definition for toxicity, but that's how I see a toxic, emotionally abusive relationship is that someone wants you to conform and be under their control and meet their sky-high standards so that you'll be exactly who they want you to be. And in every circumstance I've ever seen, whenever a relationship is set up with that dynamic, the person who tries their best to be who the other person wants them to be never accomplishes that goal. They never meet their standards. And even when they do, they always want more. And because they always want more, the person trying to do their best to meet the standards of another person or be submissive or do whatever they, the other person wants them to do, it's never enough. In fact, you will never ever be good enough for people like that. Ever. That's one of my episodes in Love and Abuse, in fact. You will never ever be good enough for a manipulative, emotionally abusive person because you will never be able to do enough. Even when you meet their standards, even when you do exactly what they want, they'll find more. And things may be good for a few days or a few weeks, but then you'll slip up because it's not who you are. And I'm not even, I shouldn't even use the word slip up. It's not that you slip up. It's that you can't be perfect for them because perfection is impossible. So you, quote, slip up, and that shows them that you aren't perfect. And when you aren't perfect, you'll never meet their standards, and you're not doing what they want you to do. So it's a vicious cycle where you try harder and try harder, and you never improve. In fact, it only gets worse, because the harder you try, the more drained you become, the less of yourself you are, and the worse the relationship gets because they keep treating you badly 
And because you keep trying harder and harder to please them and, and meet them where they want you to be, you're so drained by then that you've expended all this energy and uh, you're no longer yourself. So you can't enjoy the relationship. You can't enjoy being you. You lose yourself in relationships like that. So this is what can happen. I, I went from house guest to something like that. I'm not sure how I got there. But this is what can happen in a toxic relationship is that you become less of yourself. Oh, that's how I got there. Is that when you have a house guest, you also become less of yourself. You can't be yourself. And that feels uncomfortable. And that is one of the most difficult, most mentally unhealthy things that can happen to a person is that they are forced to be someone they're not. Because that is so draining it, it can become debilitating. It makes you tired. It stresses you out. It gives you anxiety when you feel like you can't be yourself. So I get it. That person who wrote, totally, I, I get it. You can't be yourself. And a lot of it has to do with being unable to accept the situation as it is because it's just not something you want. And there are circumstances that are not tolerable. And maybe this person who wrote in the last segment she finds that not tolerable. If that's true, if it's not, if she can't tolerate their presence, she may have to do something a little bit unorthodox and separate, but don't separate. You know, be in a different living situation, but still be married. They'll be totally unorthodox, but it might be something she has to do because her sanity's on the line. When your sanity's on the line, when you don't feel like you can be yourself, when you can't be the person that you want to be, then you might have to take extra steps so that you can be that person. But always consider that there might be things that you can accept because most of us who don't believe we can be who we want to be probably have some level of resistance already in there. Um, it's like the people with staunch, hard boundaries. No one will ever cross my boundary no matter what. And if they do, they're out of my life forever. That's a staunch hard boundary. There are people like that. If you ever cross me once, I'm going to eliminate you from my life. That's it. Never talk with you again. You're out of my life forever. So these people are very black and white and they are probably not as happy as some other people because there's no gray area. It's either all or nothing. I'm not saying it can't work. I'm saying that it can work against you a lot of the times if you're like that. If you have this staunch black and white boundaries and you don't let anyone cross for any reason and you have no flexibility whatsoever, then you're probably going to have a more difficult time in life because not everyone is aware or conscientious enough to say, oh, she has boundaries. I better watch that. They might just be oblivious. And even when you tell them, they might think, well, okay, yeah, I'll do my best, but they don't do their best or they do their best and it's not good enough. We have to be careful in those areas because sometimes uh, we need to continue teaching people in a gentle way. <laughs> hey, that's my boundary. You're being disrespectful. I just want to let you know. Oh, oh, sorry about that. Instead of saying, hey, you were being disrespectful. You're out of my life forever. We just have to be careful with black and white thinking like that. I think it can be helpful to have some resilience, have some flexibility so that we don't lock everyone out forever and then we're alone because that's what can happen. We become so staunch, don't tolerate anything that um, anyone that crosses it, they're out. And when that happens, I'm not saying you shouldn't, but if you did, you're probably going to be a lot lonelier than a lot of people. And I know there are reasons that we do that. Some, uh, some are old trauma responses. Like, I'm not going to let anyone in because I have all this trauma. That's, I get it. I get it. A lot of healing that needs to take, to take place. And you don't need to deal with anyone that comes close to violating your boundaries or your values. And um, you're okay with that. Some people are okay with that. And that's fine. If you're okay, I'm okay. <laughs> it's that book, I'm Okay, You're Okay, back in the 70s. That's a good book, actually. I, I learned quite a bit. Uh, I don't know if the, the techniques are still valid today, but it was a neat book. Anyway, I am so happy that you joined me today. Thank you for tuning in. Always keep an open mind. That's how you step into your power so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you. 
You are amazing. Thank you.